and welcome to Everybody's Business. My name is Will Boland, and I'm very pleased to have with me today Shahid Hawk Hothrath. Did I say that <laughs> right? It's Shahid Hawk Hasrath. Yeah. Shahid Hawk Hasrath. Thank you. <laughs> welcome to you. Shahid is the founder of Border Crossings Law Firm, and he is also uh, the president of a local group based out of Helena called the Montana Immigrant Justice Alliance. Did I get that right? Yeah, that's right. And there'll be a website uh, on the screen later for you to check that out. Um, Shahid, I have some questions for you today. We wanted to think a little differently today about framing the argument of immigration rather than the day-by-day -day work you do at the law firm. What, what are some of the global implications of immigration that actually slowly come to the surface here in Helena, Montana. Um, there was a report on NAFTA. Now NAFTA has been, uh, that's the North American Free Trade Agreement for those people who are not aware of that. Uh, it's been with us for 20 years. There was a report out on that and it was not positive. Uh, There's a couple of things that really stood out to me and I wanted to talk to you about that a little bit. One was uh, the trade deficit with Mexico mm -hmm. has more than doubled. That hurts the U.S. economy. The other thing was they figured maybe uh, more than a million jobs have been lost because of NAFTA. And the other thing I think that concerns you precisely is that Mexican immigration has more than doubled. Now, there is another trade policy in the works called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This is concerning the Pacific Rim. A lot of the ideas are much the same as NAFTA. Because of what we now know that NAFTA has done to Mexico and immigration northward, do you expect to see the same thing from TPP? And how does that affect you locally in your work? Well, I, first of all, th I think these are all great questions. And, you know, I've spent a lot of time, we talk about comprehensive immigration reform, we talk about whether we should grant um, you know, a form of legalization to people who are here undocumented and all these types of things, but we never talk really about you know, the other side of it. And it's really two sides of the same coin. You cannot divorce immigration from, from trade policy. And um, it's, it's just a simple fact that people don't like to acknowledge. It's a complicated discussion. Um, and I'm glad we have this venue to talk about it, but Global inequality drives immigration. It's just, uh, it, it's, you, when you look at immigration, you look at uh, the things that uh, pull people in, um, you know, em employers wanting low cost labor, they want a labor market, they call it a secondary labor market that they can exploit. And over the years, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of different types of secondary labor markets that businesses want to exploit. You see, You've seen children, of course, African American slaves was a good example. I mean, there's there's countless examples. Uh, you know, uh, undocumented migrants are one now. And what you see is things that push, things that push people to leave their countries. And you know, economic poverty, um, political strife, uh, uh, social c problems. Those are all things that push people out. But NAFTA and U.S. trade policy is one of the biggest ex and clearest examples. And so, in terms of problems NAFTA has caused, uh, you know, I, I, I've seen a lot of, a lot of that pretty, uh, pretty directly sometimes um, from talking to the clients that I have in my office. They tell me exactly why they want to leave their, uh, why they had to leave their country and, and to take care of their children. And it's, it's, it's a result of NAFTA. Maybe they don't identify it as being part of NAFTA, but it was, uh, you know. Um, but uh, in, in terms of trade policies in general, we don't want to see more that follow the model of, of NAFTA because, you know, here in Montana, you, you, you'll see a lot of, you'll talk to a lot of union folks, you'll talk, talk to a lot of, um, you know, hardworking, um, hardworking Montanans who think that NAFTA is a bad idea because it outsources jobs to Mexico, it outsources jobs um, outside of the United States. But, um, and that, that's true. But the other problem about NAFTA is that it, uh, w by allowing the free flow of products and, and, and goods, but not the free flow of labor. It actually contributes to global inequality. Like you said, Mexico's deficit, um, you know, really uh, skyrocketing. And, 
you know, conceptually so that viewers can kind of understand, think about it in terms of, uh, of this. When you, when you look at Mexico without, without NAFTA, you'd have certain, um, certain products and services that were actually being um, created locally by Mexicans in, in Mexico. Um, corn being a, a big agricultural product, several other agricultural products, and different things that were being, um, you know, created right there in Mexico. Um, it allowed farmers to have their jobs. It allowed farmers to hire others to work on that farm. Um, it, a whole industry of money, um, you know, w w the, the, the income, the, the money that's generated staying in the, state, in, in the country of Mexico. But when these big multinational companies found tax benefits and tax breaks by outsourcing um, factories to Mexico, what you saw is that they were able to um, hire workers, um, Mexican workers, at, at low wages without protections that the U.S. labor market demands, you know, um, uh, limits on hours, limits on safe working conditions, and uh, limits on wages. So they were able to pay people very little, make them work very hard, and um, put them in unsafe conditions. And so um, Mexican workers can't tolerate that type of environment any more than anyone else. At the same time, uh, the, the U.S. is flooding the Mexican market with products that Mexico used to create on their own. So Subsidized corn, for instance. Yeah, that's a very good example. You know, um, uh, the Mexicans getting their tortillas from the U.S. as opposed to creating them locally, you know, yeah. and putting farmers out of business. So what do they do? Where do they find their jobs? How do they su support themselves? And, you know, we share a border with Mexico. And we, um, it, you really, um, you know, I, I, people say, well, why can't people obey the laws and why can't they, uh, you know, um, allow their families to starve? Why can't they um, follow the law as opposed to just crossing this imaginary border, coming into the U.S. and finding um, a lot more options for themselves and their families? Um, you know, I think in a way, when I debate the issue of immigration with people, the ultimate trump card for people who have families is, what would you do? What would you do if you had a family that you couldn't support? And you could see right over there, right across this imaginary line in the sand, you can, you can pursue, you can have a better life for your family that you can't find in your own home country. And that's, you know, a big, big driver of immigration. And, you know, somebody gave me a, a good conceptual example too. And, um, you know, it's not the same thing, but it's an example of, look at, look at eastern Montana and, and North Dakota with the, with the boom in, in the oil fields, Bakken. Um, Wages offered there are substantially higher. There, there are opportunities, jobs, wages. Um, how, many, how many Montanans do you know of who have gone that route, gone over to, to, to that area to work for, for better wages for their family, be, better ways to support themselves? Uh, people mm -hmm. flocking from all over the country. Many. It, you know, it's just a little microcosm of the same idea. The idea is that when, when the economy has created a situation where um, there are factors pushing you out. You know, right now we've got a recession in a lot of parts of the country that's pushing people out, and the, the Bakken is pulling people in. They've, they're able to offer wages. They're able to, and, and it, it just, it's working that way. It's they're a immigrating to North Dakota. Exactly. You know, if you can get paid, uh, you know, three times more at a McDonald's in, 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 in North Dakota than you can in a tiny place in, in Montana, you, you'll go for it. The peculiar difference may be that in North Dakota they will triple their wages, but in Mexico just the opposite happens. There almost seems to be a rush to the bottom. Wages are depressed and uh, people are forced off the land, forced to go into urban environments, slums, ghettos, poverty, and ultimately forced to go north to look for anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a big difference. It's you know? peculiar that NAFTA would be sold as jobs when just the opposite happens. Yeah, you know, the, um, but, you know, really the problem with NAFTA is that it contributes to global inequality. If we were to create a system where um, perhaps NAFTA existed, but, uh, but on the other side of it, there was, a fr there was an immigration policy that allowed for the free flow of people then people could then relocate where they needed to, and perhaps then things might equalize out. You know, perhaps then um, people who weren't satisfied with the working conditions in Mexico as a result of NAFTA could leave, come to the United States, seek out um, a better life where they could find it. Perhaps then the economic model could work. But 
The way it works right now, it, it, it doesn't work because you have um, the artificial restriction of immigration policy standing in the way. So you're making an argument that immigration should be a part of trade policies, that is the free flow of labor also rather than just capital. Yeah, I think if you, if you don't do it, you're deliberately closing your eyes to uh, the reality of the situation for, for real people. And you know maybe that's really what um, co big corporations want, honestly, because big corporations, um, multinational corporations who may have opened a factory in Mexico, they, they, they benefit from treating their Mexican workers um, like, uh, you know, like the subhuman uh, worker ants. You know, they, they don't have to pay them well, they don't have to treat them well. But when those workers are then driven out of their country and come into the United States, they're undocumented workers. The same companies can benefit from hiring those undocumented workers, but once again, since they're undocumented and can't take advantage of the full protections of the U.S. labor market, they can treat them badly in the U.S. as well. It's almost like a win-win for them. Um, for companies that, that want, want cheap labor and uh, don't want to have to deal with labor protections, um, that's a model that's working for them. The problem is it's not working for the rest of the U.S. There are problems associated with that um, that other, other um, people are suffering. And so it's, uh, it's a, something that we need to take care of, but getting, um, that, you know, getting, that, getting that resolution is going to be difficult since so many people benefit from it. So you're saying corporations, it's a win-win that they depress wages on both sides of the borders and uh, eliminate protections for labor also, and so they, they basically control the international labor market while they make capital. That's right, you know, and some very smart and savvy unions along the southern border have recognized that. And, you know, um, sometimes, for instance, um, uh, I believe it was, um, you know, a, a mining operation um, it, it, that had facilities in both in Mexico and, um, you know, in, in, in the southern part of America, uh, south, southern part of the United States. Um, they, the, the union there recognized that when workers were treated badly in Mexico, that did have an impact on them. And so they kind of banded together and they would help, e help one another out, um, recognizing that they're in the same boat. They're, they're not enemies of one another. It's not, it's not that undocumented um, Mexicans coming into the United States are you know, de depressing wages and ruining uh, the labor market for everybody. They're not really the enemy. The enemy is the, the, the corporations, the companies that, um, that create this dynamic and benefit from it. So, uh, you know, undocumented workers coming into the U.S., studies have shown again and again, when, when they are able to obtain work authorization very quickly, they demand workplace protections, they demand higher wages. So a lot of people say that um, undocumented immigration, you know, undocumented immigrants will lower the, the wages that U.S. workers can earn. And that may be true, but the answer isn't to try to deport everybody. That's never going to happen. The answer is that a rising tide lifts all ships. If, if uh, you provide benefits and protections to the undocumented workers, they will soon um, take advantage of those protections and everybody will be on a level playing field. So, um, Is it fair to say that the immigrants then are being scapegoated. There may even be an element of racism to it. On a local level, do you see people rather misinformed about it and blaming the victim? I think that's right, absolutely. I think that because Mexicans are a readily identifiable segment of the population, um, easily uh, identified, easily targeted, I think, yeah, I think they're being scapegoated a fair bit. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, they're being blamed for a dynamic that, that they, you know, how, how could you blame somebody for coming into the United States? To they're helpless elections? against. Yeah, uh, but, uh, but really why not blame the U.S. immigration policy that doesn't um, create pathways for the average um, person to come into the United States and so um, that, that makes them enter as undocumented aliens as opposed to taking advantage of, a, of an immigration policy that would allow them to some, some pathway to come in uh, legally. So, Do you feel that's part of your mission uh, with the Montana Immigrant Justice Alliance 
to educate people as to the problem uh, and stop the scapegoating? Yeah, absolutely. That's a big part of it. In fact, that's a, that's a part of our mission statement. Um, yeah, and you can read our mission statement on, on the website, but um, educating the public about uh, contributions that immigrants have made to the community, the, 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 the fact that immigrants aren't to be scapegoated, but actually are, um, have historically been a very, Im immigration has been a very important part of our country's history. And the only difference nowadays is that immigration policies become more restrictive the ways to come in legally have become uh, far, far fewer. At the same time, NAFTA has driven, uh, has created global in inequality, driven more people to come into the United States illegally. And our immigration system hasn't adapted to that, th that reality. It hasn't adapted to that by um, you know, ultimately creating more pathways for people to come in legally and um, resolving it or um, changing the way NAFTA works. But, you know, you can't have it both ways. You can't, uh, you know, create such inequality that people need to come into the United States and then at the same time provide them no way to do so legally and then shrug your shoulders and wonder why we have so many undocumented immigrants in the United States. Just, just flat out uh, faulty logic, faulty reasoning. That seems to be a formula for disaster. Yeah, yeah, and, that, and that's what we've seen, you know, and so we talk about the solution in terms of comprehensive immigration reform and that's, you know, that's a good solution. Um, and uh, I think sometimes people's frustration with immigration reform is, okay, we pass, uh, say, a legalization program for people who are here without status right now, but then what happens when we don't solve NAFTA and people still keep coming in, you know? Um, so the answer to that is that any immigration reform policy has to be done very carefully and has to not only um, legalize people who are here without status now, but it also has to reform the, the options, the, the types of visas that are available, make more available for people who are in unskilled labor groups um, so that they can still come in even if they don't have immediate family members here right now. So, you know, right now, if you're an unskilled worker and, and you don't have immediate family in the U.S., you're not getting in. There, there's no way for you to come in. There's no line. There's no option. There's no pathway. And that, that can't work when you're, when you're dealing with a country that shares a border with us and has um, extreme poverty right now. So there needs to be, needs to do better on that. But uh, Well, in the last couple of minutes we have left, could you talk about how uh, the law firm tries to address some of these issues? Because I think in a nutshell, it seems that uh, people come here for a better life for reasons that uh, are embedded in U.S. trade policy. And so there's something fundamentally that has to change. How do you uh, hope to do that here in Montana? Well, you know, um, every, uh, every client of mine that I talk to, um, I, I, I hold free legal clinics oftentimes. Um, in, I've done a lot of in, in Bozeman and West Yellowstone. We're planning to do some in Billings. And, you know, I, I talk to my clientele. I, I review their entire immigration history, what brought them here, why they're here, what they do here. And, um, oftentimes I find that they may have options available to them that they didn't know about. And I, um, you know, I really just try to see what I can do to, um, to allow them to utilize the restrictive immigration policies that we have right now, but to utilize them however they can to, um, to level the playing field, get them, get them a work authorization card, get them a green card. Um, I've encountered people who, um, believe it or not, are U.S. citizens, but they didn't realize it because they had parents who, for instance, um, often crossed the border from U.S. to Mexico, and uh, one person was born in Mexico, but her father um, had spent enough time in the U.S. that, uh, that he was a citizen and transferred it to her. So, you know, really, I, um, I try to do what I can to, to help people and, and uh, reduce um, the inequality that they experience when they're here undocumented. Well, Shahid Haq Hasrath, you are fighting the good fight. Uh, really happy to have you here today. We're out of time. Uh, maybe we can have you back again. This discussion can go on forever because obviously there's bigger issues at play here with uh, the new trade policy uh, around the Pacific Rim that's probably going to have the same ramifications that people like yourself will have to deal with here. And so um, we'll see how this goes in the future. But right now, locally, you're 
you're doing good work here, and it's a pleasure to have you on today. Oh, it was a pleasure, Will. Thanks a lot. It was a very, very great discussion. Good. Nice to see you, and nice to see everybody out there. This is Will Boland for Everybody's Business, and we'll see you next week.